Well, as we begin this morning, I just want us all to be clear on this, and I think we are, that our church does not get into politics. However, we do emphasize doctrine, and doctrine forms our political views, does it not? Good doctrine forms good political views. For a Christian to support a party that endorses everything that's contrary to sound doctrine tells you that they have either had very poor teaching, they're naive or simple, or there's a lot of compromise in their lives. The world is going to be the world, aren't they? So we have no problem with them endorsing certain things, but when the church endorses certain things, then that can be a problem. And the world will be the world. They're going to promote worldly views, and they're going to challenge everything that God has said, everything that's right or moral or good, just. And that is the spirit of Antichrist. That's the world. The Antichrist spirit contradicts everything that God has said is right or just or moral. And you see this in the first appearance of the serpent in the garden. There it is in a capsule. He challenges everything that God has said and contradicts. I mean, that's been his his agenda from the beginning. But let's just look at Genesis 3-1 for a minute. It's a little picture of his agenda here. It says... Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the field. Did God say that? God doesn't want you to eat of this fruit because he knows that you're going to become wise and he'll feel threatened and this and that and you'll be like him and In verse 4, and the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. So he's going to challenge everything that God has said and contradict everything that God has said. So there it is in a capsule. Everything that God has called right and good and just, you know, he's going to contradict uh, and he's going to promote everything. Uh, evil, he's going to just take the counterpart of everything that God has said. Now, as we said, it's one thing for the world to take that stance and to contradict what God has said and promote what God has said not to. But when the church chimes in with that, then there's a problem. And the real problem is this, that we're coming into a time when the whole world is going to make a a choice for Christ or the Antichrist. And if the church can chime in with an agenda that's totally contrary to God here, then they're going to also embrace the message of the Antichrist as well. That's a big concern. So, Party X, call them Party X, how's that? We don't want to incriminate anybody. Party X supports everything that God has condemned. And who does the Antichrist appeal to? To the lawbreaker, people that do not have a lot of character, those who don't pay their debts, to the immoral or the simple or those who want something for nothing. But in the grand final, the whole world has to make a choice, going left or going right. And the Antichrist is a flatterer. He's going to say what appeals to people, what sounds good, what feels good. Uh, Going to tell people what they want to hear. He speaks peace and prosperity and tolerance, acceptance, and all of the things that you deserve. And, you know, the message that really people relate to, especially the world. But the real issue that should concern the Christian are not 
economic. That's not what we should be concerned with, economy. The real issues that we should be concerned with are moral. I mean, economy is a consequence of of a righteous nation. God blesses those who are righteous. Even the Puritans in England, they were denied all kinds of political positions and jobs. They prospered in the midst of all of that because they were moral and just. They were righteous. Now, when you think of people in Scripture, nations, times in Israel's history when they really prospered, uh, you take a look at the, the king who was over them and what he was promoting, you can understand why they prospered. For example, King Jehoshaphat in Second Chronicles 17, this king sought the Lord. He removed all the idols from the land. He sent teachers throughout the kingdom teaching God's laws. And so God blessed and prospered the land many ways. Other nations were afraid to make war with him. Other nations even sent presents to King Jehoshaphat. God was blessing him because he was upholding God's standard. Even business prospered. It's got a few verses in Second Kings. So I'm sorry, Second Chronicles. You can find it in Second Kings too, but Second Chronicles 17 and verses 12 and 13. It says, uh, and Jehoshaphat waxed great exceedingly, and he built in Judah castles and cities of store, and he had much business in the cities of Judah, and the men of war and mighty men of valor were in Jerusalem. A lot of business. God was blessing this nation because they were doing things right. And good economy is a consequence of doing things right. In fact, If a nation really prospered when they weren't doing things right, that just tells the nation we don't need God. And that's a big problem. But the evil one makes prosperity and economy a central issue. It's all about what you can get, what you can have. And morality is never the issue. Amen. So Daniel... Daniel pictures the Antichrist becoming strong with the small people. It's interesting, my dear friend uh, Swarup, Pastor Swarup, was reminding me of this verse here the other day, that the Antichrist becomes strong with the small people. Well, we're not talking about small physically. We're not talking about few in number. We're talking about small in character that he appeals to those who are of small character. That's who he appeals to. And I hope we don't fit into that scenario. But let's just consider the policies that Party X endorses and see how they align with Scripture. And as we said, this, is, this message is not to the world. This is to the church. And to those who fly in under the banner of Christendom, as Jesus himself said, that his main concern was with the church, not with the world, with the church. And let me just quote here from John seventeen nine, And don't misunderstand this verse because Christ does care for the world. He died for the world, but his main concern is for the church. In John seventeen nine, Jesus said, I pray for them, I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. Jesus' main concern is for his own people. He is concerned for the world, but his main concern is for his people. I pray for them, I'm not praying for the world, I pray for them. God wants us to make it, and he wants us to represent him here upon earth. Now, one of the first promises made to Abraham's seed, the natural seed, was that God would bless the nations that blessed them and curse the nations that cursed Israel or opposed them. And so, in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 3, familiar little verse here, the Lord said, 
I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Now, I'm saying this because we're looking at party X. Party X condemns Israel, supports the Palestinian cause and the Muslim cause, and even berates Christianity. In fact, uh, back a few years ago, they had to vote three times whether they wanted to leave the name of God in their agenda, period. And, in fact, you know, they push Christian values out of uh, the school. But that's Party X. Party X endorses homosexuality, which is an abomination to God. Old Testament and New Testament. Many verses to substantiate that, especially in Romans chapter 1 and verse 24 through 28. The Apostle Paul and the Apostle John tell us that those who practice these things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. In other words, they don't go to heaven. Unless, of course, there's repentance there. And then also, uh, both John and Paul um, you know, in this passage, and we're oh, jumping to another verse here, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 9, I mean, they say the same thing, but they also include the transgender in that group that do not inherit the kingdom of God as well. And so let's just look at this for a minute. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 9, and he's... He's telling these Corinthians who were pretty carnal, those who will not inherit the kingdom of God. But he also goes on to tell them, but you're washed, you're justified, you've been changed by the power of God. These things you were, past tense, you're not now. But in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, Paul says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, that's the pervert, that's transgender, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, and some translations say sodomites, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So both Old Testament and New Testament condemn the pervert or the transgender, And this is how God looks at the act. And I'm quoting here from Deuteronomy 22 and verse 5. Now, what was an abomination to God in the Old Testament? God didn't change his mind in the New Testament. An abomination is an abomination, Old Testament and New Testament. Deuteronomy 22, 5. The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, neither shall a man put on a woman's garment, for all that do so are abomination unto the Lord thy God. And God's opinion hasn't changed any. And again, Paul said, Some of these things ye were, but ye're washed, you're sanctified, and you're justified. Party X endorses all of these things that God calls an abomination. And again, the reason I'm emphasizing this is not to the world, it's to the church. Because when you see the church going this direction, then there's a a problem. And many of the Christians today endorse candidates that are part of a party that endorses all of these things, and that is a problem. Because the big test is yet to come. And if people can endorse these policies and these people politically, they'll endorse the Antichrist who is anti-law and opposes everything that God has called right and good. Party X endorses abortion, which is murder. And by the way, I'm not copying your last message. I had this written before your last message here. Okay. Uh, Life begins in the womb, and David clearly tells us that in Psalm 139, that God ordains every feature of our being while we're 
in the womb, and that's where life begins. And abortion is murder. In Psalm 139, beginning in verse 13, For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. Verse 15, My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance yet being unperfect and in thy book all my members were written which in continuance were fashioned when as yet there was none of them. This is where life begins in the womb. God fashions every part of us. He determines the number of hair upon our head. And so this is where life begins in the womb. You know, it's interesting that in New York State, uh, the governor, you know, is endorsing abortion not only to, not only to six months, but beyond. I mean, almost to the day of birth. And you have crowds cheering about those kind of, you know, Allowances. What that is spiritually, I mean, if you compare that to the Old Testament, is the worship of Moloch. Moloch was a god of sex, which is appeased by offering your children on the fire to this god. And that essentially is what people do. They're offering up their children to the, to Moloch. And you find that in Leviticus 20 and verse 2. Party X encourages welfare and caters to the non-contributing class of society. In fact, much of the welfare society, the generational welfare, they enjoy more benefits than a lot of the working class does. And When you think about the generational welfare, you're talking about people who contribute nothing but offspring to the state, which generally turn up to be, to give us problems later on because there's no fathers and they just add to the criminal element in the country. The scripture in no wise encourages welfare sloth, It's one thing to be hurt or to be laid off, and charity plays a part in our system to take care of people like that. But the scripture says those who do not work should not eat. Right? 2 Thessalonians 3.10 For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. And if you take a look at some of the anarchy going on in a country, probably the biggest share of them fall into the category of people who are being paid by the state and don't work at all. Party X endorses letting down the standard and allowing illegal aliens into the country, many of which would like to destroy us, allowing undocumented aliens in. It's it's absurdity. Even the kingdom of God requires registration and documentation. And at the end of life, those who are not recorded in the book do not enter the kingdom, do they? Even God requires documentation. And there's a way that you get in. There's a legal way to get in. You don't jump over the wall. Revelation 20 and verse 15. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. We have to be in the book. We have to come in through the gate. We have to come in the right way. Or in the end, we're cast out. So even God has laws concerning documentation, doesn't he? Party X supports the criminal over law enforcement. They appeal to the lawbreaker. In fact, these are the kind of people that keep them in office. That's why they appeal to them, because they vote them back in. 
And it's the small people that elect these people back into office. They want the kind of people that, they want the kind of officials that favor drugs and, you know, want to ease all the restrictions, justify the looter over the law enforcement. And you know what? The news media plays a big part in this too because they're evil too for the most part. I think much of them are controlled by the the liberal um, agenda, by the liberal people, and they have everybody in this country thinking, I mean, they're just, it's total imbalance. They're blowing up one part of it and never mentioning the other part. Well, you know, the scripture condemns um, especially those that despise law and order. And um, I have another verse here in Second Peter chapter 2. God's wrath especially targets those who despise government, despise authority, despise the law. And In verse 10, but chiefly them that walk after the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise government. That's authority. Presumptuous are they, self-willed. They're not afraid to speak evil of dignities. Party X. Party X also pushes an agenda, especially in school and any public place that Undermines the Ten Commandments. They want Ten Commandments taken down from all public places. And they undermine all of the Christian values. And in Revelation twenty two fourteen, I mean, those who enter heaven are those who keep the commandments. And you can just see the mind of, of this party. They're totally wicked. This party has tried to remove any monument that says thou shalt not or thou shalt. Revelation twenty two fourteen. Blessed are they that do his commandments that they may have right to, to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. So those who enter into heaven are those who keep the commandments. So you can see why, you know, this party is pushing the commandments out the door. That's Satan. He's the God of this world. In fact, uh, if you take a look at the Garden of Eden scene, you know, we think of them breaking that one commandment where they ate of the forbidden fruit. But uh, actually I wrote a book and a little page how that, in effect, they broke all ten commandments there in the Garden. It wasn't just that one. They broke all ten. But, of course, the enemy says we don't need the Ten Commandments, and this party is pushing the agenda of Antichrist. And then the history of Party X is also racist. You're going right back to the Civil War. It was Party X that was for slavery. It was the other party that wanted the slaves to be released. Our roots and our family go way back. We go back to even before the revolution. On my mother's side and some of my grand great great grandfathers were in the French and Indian War, Revolution and Civil War on the side of the North. And for the sake of freedom and setting people free. This other party, if you follow their history, is far more racist than the press makes them out to be. But Party X promises or promotes anything and everything that appeals to the unscrupulous, naive populace with no regard to the exorbitant debt that this country is in. 
We're going to give you this. We're going to give you that. From where? From whence? Who's paying for it? All right. They picture themselves as the Robin Hood taken from those bad old rich people and given to the people who do nothing with their lives, worked hard to better themselves, and giving to people that do nothing but create problems. And as you study the Proverbs, you find many Proverbs that tell you that it's the hand of the diligent that make rich. They work hard for what they have. Proverbs 10.4, the hand of the diligent maketh rich. So, party X wants to take from those who've worked hard and give it to those who've done nothing. You know, I don't want a socialist state here. But I think we've said enough to make the point. You see, a person's political views reveal their spiritual state. And as I have said, our main concern isn't that the world goes this direction because that's what we expect from them. But when we see the church chiming in with this, then there's a problem. And anybody that can chime in with this kind of an agenda will go for the Antichrist because that's exactly what he's going to come on as the flatterer who's going to give you everything. Okay. See, the greatest test is coming. Another interesting observation that we've made already concerning Party X is how that they do control the press. And, you know, you know how the, uh, you know, the Bolshevik revolution, uh, they took over Russia early 1900s, Bolsheviks, um, but do you know what percentage of the country was Bolshevik? About 5%. 5% of the country was Bolshevik. So how did they take over a country like that? When 5% of the country was for the movement and 95 were against the movement, how did they take over the country? It's because they controlled the press. They had everybody in the country believing that there's no... Uh, sense in trying to go against this movement because everybody is for this movement when indeed there was only 5% of the country that was Bolshevik. But the press had the whole nation brainwashed into thinking that everybody is for this movement. No sense in going against it. That's why we don't listen to the news, right, Dan? But you see, today we're in a nation that's divided, and the real reason is not political, it's spiritual. Because a person's spiritual convictions really controls their political choice as well. And it almost takes us back to the time of Elijah, where you see the nation is divided and, you know, he's saying, how long are you going to halt between two opinions? I mean, here's a divided nation and they're halting between two opinions. And so Elijah brings them to Mount Carmel for the big test in First Kings 18. And it's going to be a test by fire. The real God is going to answer by fire. And if God be God, serve him. And if Baal is God, then serve him. Well, you know what happens here on Mount Carmel, don't you? The fire came down and consumed the altar on the altar that Elijah had built. And the whole nation fell on their face and said, the Lord is God. Well, you know what? We kind of have to see this happen today in the church. We need to see the fire come down on the church so that the whole world is convinced that the Lord is God. We need to see miracles. We need to see supernatural things happen that 
cannot be gainsaid or contradicted anymore that that God is going to move in his church in such a way that things change. That's where we're at. I mean, we have to see God move upon the church today. Let the real God answer by fire. And when he did, they all fell on their face and said, the Lord is God. See, if something doesn't happen in the church world today, a lot of the church world will go for the Antichrist. Because it's the same spirit. That's the spirit of the world. That's the direction going. And that's why good doctrine is important. Good doctrine coupled with holy fear will keep us from falling in the days to come. And incidentally, party A, which I will not name, pretty much opposes or endorses everything that's its utter other party is for or against. They're on the other side of the fence. But you see that spirituality, our spiritual place, is going to determine our political view as well. Amen?